we're, we're adopting something in the university world, which is having a, a respondent to each discussant. Um, it's very much up to the respondent to kind of take things as they will, but hopefully that's going to be somebody who can help provide a little extra insight into the main presentations and then lead into uh, audience discussion. Now, I'm, um, I, I, I think I have to be fairly strict with the main presentations. I've warned 35 minutes, and I'll be uh, <coughs> running a clock on that. But uh, I'm, I'm actually very looking forward to having had, had Peter do a presentation of the details of the, of the Settle initiative. But I'd like to hand over to you now. Thank you very much. I'll leave you to introduce yourself more <laughs> fully. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, first gentleman. I'm Peter Randall. Um, <coughs> many years in uh, financial services. And we're just going to do a little uh, series of uh, experiments here. So I think this is a quite a nice way of, uh, of uh, starting off. So for the purposes of this, Professor Adams has become a central bank. Professor Adams is now going to issue something onto a chain. He's going to issue 100 euros onto a chain. We're just going to pass this around if we could. Just pass it around the room. It's great. <coughs> Pass it round. Pass it round. Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I've broken the chain. You've broken the chain. About once every 10 years in financial services, something large comes along. Um, about once a decade. So in the 70s, it was SWIFT. 1973, SWIFT formed. 1979 was the first US dollar transactions. In the 1980s, it was the establishment of CSDs. Central Securities Depositories. In the 1990s, by and large, it was the era, it was the, ah, uh, oh, put it back onto the picture if you want. Um, in, 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 uh, in, in the 1990s, it was uh, RTGS, uh, and it was, uh, okay. uh, in 1990s, it was RTGS. Uh, in the year 2000, the biggest platform in the world had only just been formed, ICE. And we started in May 2000. Today it's the biggest. The second biggest platform <coughs> in the world, BATS ChiX, or BATS, was founded in about 2003. So the 2000s, the noughties, if you will, were the application of 21st century technology to technology stacks that were actually still running COBOL on mainframes. <coughs> this time around, in the, in the teens, the, this decade, the big te technology project is going to be blockchain. So that's the way we say, think about the history. I think that's very important to start with. Second point I'd like to make is what does the city or any financial services center really do? What does it really do? Many, many, many things. I and mean, it's quite easy to, to point with the program to all sorts of bad things out. But really what it does is it keeps very large lists of ledgers. There's a ledger for cash, there's a ledger for bonds, there's a ledger for derivatives, there's a ledger for FX, there's a ledger for property. All those ledgers are slightly different. They all really record an amount, a quantity, a name, a date, and all the rest of it. But, but what they really are at the end of the day is just a ledger. But they're all slightly different. They've grown up for different historical reasons, but there's an enormous amount of knitting. And it's the knitting which contains a number of things. First of all, it's very expensive to operate. <coughs> Second of all, it's very complex to operate, which means that when it goes wrong, it, it becomes very, very difficult to find out exactly where things are. And what I mean by that is that you have to have all sorts of, you know, complex resolution systems and complex sort of ways of, 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 of sorting out problems. So that's very difficult. Has that now gone round? Excellent. If it could come back. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've just been a blockchain. You've just demonstrated a distributed ledger. You saw the asset moving around, everybody knew where it was. That's how easy it is. It's not complicated. Now, if you take that as the view, I mean, obviously, there's a bit more technology, there's a bit more clever things that go in there. But if you take that as the view, I hope, have they not connected my... Oh. Ah, let's see if this works. Uh, if you take that as the view, then I think you're going to be into reasonably good shape. And with a bit of luck, no? Can we get the techie back? Was your, your presentation wasn't loaded on there, you had it on No, I've got it on my, my thing here. Um, oh, is it coming up? Okay, uh. all right. Okay, 
So, can we see that? We can, great. Good. So we take that as the view, um, we, can, we can start. Let's just start with something really simple. <coughs> this is the simplified version of how equity settlements take place. <clears throat> so you've got some investors here, you've got a market which sets the price that the assets get exchanged at. These big long lists and ledgers, the second thing the city does is it also has mechanisms by which ownership structures can be changed. And one of those great ways of doing it is an exchange. And exchanges now, as a result of the ICE and all the rest of it, are now a lot more efficient. So you've got one set of activity going on here. <clears throat> then it moves to a general clearing member, then it goes into clearing, CSDs, custodians, subcustodians, investors, registrars. Wow. Registrars, they keep, have a look at CompuShare, keeps 100 million records, charges $10 per record <clears throat> per year before it moves anything. So it makes a billion dollars a year for just keeping records. Ladies and gentlemen, you probably all know you can keep 100 million records today on a mobile phone. <laughs> this whole thing, this knitting, if you will, costs, not my numbers, but these numbers are wrong, costs between 65 and $80 billion, according to, according to Oliver Wyman. Why are those numbers wrong? Well, they don't, they don't cover three really important things. The first thing they don't cover is liquidity charges. Has anybody ever read the LCH balance sheet or LCH uh, 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 report and accounts? They kind of brag about the amount of deposits that they have overnight. Where do those deposits come from? They come from the banks to fund the actual activities. So there's, there's, there's tens of billions of dollars just sitting effectively in overnight systems that are, that are, that are there. Of, of course, ostensibly to protect against risk. But uh, in, in, in reality, that 65, 80 billion doesn't cover that. It doesn't cover the capital charges either against those liquidity <coughs> players. And it certainly doesn't cover any of the messaging charges. So when you write for Swift, it'd be really interesting to put some, uh, put some charges in that uh, Swift uses. Now, when you really have a good think about it, and it, I think it really is uh, incumbent upon people in this space to, to think rather than just uh, talk, when you have some really good thinking about this, you've got to realise that banks, in reality, only do three things. And they'd like to tell you they do a lot more, but it's really only three things. They make a single-sided payment. So I pay you. I'm a bank, I pay you. That's one thing they do, right? Second thing they do is a delivery versus payment. I pay you, you give me some security. Give me a bond or a stock or a or something. The third thing they do, <clears throat> quite important, is they do a payment versus payment. I give you some money, you give me some money. Now, PVP, for all intents and purposes, is a foreign exchange transaction. I give you some dollars, you give me some euros. I give you some yen, you give me some sterling. PVP, payment versus payment. DVP, delivery versus payment. SSP, single-sided payment. Solve, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, for P. In fact, rather more than 50% of every single financial market transaction is a payment. So that's a really critical place to start. And banks can only pay each other in a really special way. I'm sure you all know how that happens, but I'll explain just in case people don't. I can pay you, I can pay anybody in this room by actually getting some central bank money out and saying, look, you know, here you go. Peer-to-peer -peer central bank money exchange. It works really well. That's one way. I can pay you like that, but, you know, HSBC can't pay Barclays like that. <clears throat> Another way I could pay you is by using faster payments. Another way I could go and get some cash out of the cash machine and I could pay you that way. I could write you a check. There are a whole series of ways in which I could pay you. But that's fine because you're perfectly prepared to accept from me into your bank a credit because it's on your bank. Now, what does it mean when it's on your bank? Well, it's effectively you have now got commercial bank money. So anybody that banks with HSBC, that you're taking the risk that HSBC is not going to go belly up. That's what you're basically doing. But banks between each other can't take that risk. HSBC is never prepared to sort of say, uh, you know, Barclays phones them up and say, we owe you a million quid. Oh, but don't worry, we've opened an account in your name and I'll send a checkbook around. HSBC will say, well, that's all very interesting, thank you very much, but you haven't paid me. 
because there's only one way that HSBC and Barclays can extinguish the interbank liability, and that way is to make a transfer across a specialist system called an RTGS system, real-time gross settlement service, which is or system, which is operated by the central bank. And that is when you hear people just, you know, make the distinction between central bank money and commercial bank money. Central bank money is the way in which banks can pay each other. And what that basically means is that when, when, when Barclays pays HSBC using, a, using a, um, uh, an RTGS transfer, really straightforwardly, what happens is that a million pounds is debited from the Barclays account and a million pounds ends up in the HSBC account. Payment has then been made and it accords with a number of bun a bunch of things. The most important one is it, it achieves settlement finality. So if at that point Barclays goes bust, the liquidators can't get that money back because it's moved in central bank money. That's really, really important. Settlement finality is right. So, to be of generalized use to the financial services industry, you've got to take the view, <coughs> I believe, that the place to start is in the ability to be able to move central bank money. Now, that sounds like a really difficult thing to do, right? <coughs> Go on and speak to Mark Carney and say, hey, could we, could we have some money, please? Because we'd like to move it around between banks. Sounds really, really, very really difficult. But let's just bear with me for the argument because I'll, I'll show you how I think this can happen. So let's say the first thing to do is to be able to move central bank money, i.e., to allow banks in one jurisdiction with one currency the ability to extinguish interbank liabilities with central bank money. Yeah, okay, that's fine. The next one, the really quite exciting one, because it's the biggest market in the world, the FX market, is the ability to have another central bank's money on there. So if you've got sterling on there, for example, and then you get some euros on there, you can now swap euros for sterling. I can give you central bank money, sterling. You can give me central bank money, euros. Effectively, we've affected a transfer of assets. If we can do that on a single ledger structure, things start to get very exciting. So when you've done single bank, a single central bank, double central bank, then you can start to get into to, 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 to other obligations. The first obligations, I think it's probably easier to get into, are, are, are fixed income securities, bonds. Corporations issue bonds all the time. Uh, they're very straightforward. They, they're not usually tied up in CSDs. They can be, but they're not always. And, and, and effectively, they're, they're, they're pretty easy to, to administer. So once they've been issued uh, onto, um, uh, they, they, can, they, can be, they can be moved around very easily. Phase four is a bit more complicated, a little bit more complicated, because this is now in CSD land, and CSD land is, is, is basically uh, equities and uh, securities uh, that uh, have to go through a CSD. It does become a bit more complicated, but I can show you the answer. I'm not going to spend the rest of the afternoon describing the answer. Mindful of the 35 minutes I've got. Um, and then phase five is, you know, all the other stuff. <clears throat> so, <coughs> question, how do you get money issued onto the system? On the left here, you've got the existing system. I don't know if you can see around there, Richard. <laughs> on the left, you've got the existing system. So bank A here, I would say it's Barclays, and bank B here is, let's say, is HSBC. The way in which Barclays can pay HSBC is they send a swift message, which goes to Chaps. Chaps then alters the balance at, uh, uh, at the settlement account at the Bank of England. Message comes back. Bank B now receives the message that it's, it's got the million pounds, and bank A receives the message it's just had its account debt to the million pounds. That happens about 146, 147,000 times a day. And that moves on average of between 450 and 500 billion pounds a day. So that's really moving about a third of UK GDP on a daily basis moves through this system. An order of magnitude, you know, some days it's less. It's open, uh, you'll be pleased to know, it's open five days a week. Uh, and uh, it runs at the moment for about six hours a day. So the rest of the time, when it's not open, banks just have to keep those liabilities on their books. 
But the regulators, they're clever, right? You keep the liability on the book, the bank says, well, you know, we're not sure that that bank might not go bust, so you've got to put some capital by. So you've got to keep putting capital into the system to protect against the fact that the Bank of England's central system isn't open. That gets quite expensive. Now, there are another set of ways in which RTGS balances can be changed. And it's up here, we call them <coughs> DNS, delayed net settlement. So there's four of them. Now, there are there are more, but, but you know, the diagram just gets messy if you, if you add too many. And so you've got link, uh, you've got faster payments, you've got banks, and you've got check and credit. Check and credit clearing, everybody knows that. Um, it's, it's very straightforward. Link, cash machines. You take 50 quid out of a HSBC machine you've got an account with RBS, they've got to settle that 50 quid between themselves. What they do, in fact, is net it all off, and they settle it once a day <coughs> when the system's open. Backs, big old batch, cobalt, mainframe, clearing system that, 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 that basically pays salaries and does direct credits and stuff like that. Faster payments is really interesting. It clears three times a day during the times that RTGS is open. The most important thing about it is that I can pay Martin now straight away, no problem at all. That's dead easy to do. My bank will be debited, his bank will be credited, will his bank account be debited, uh, credited, mine will be debited effectively in real time. But actually, his bank doesn't settle with my bank, my bank doesn't settle with his bank, <laughs> except three times a day. So think about it like this, if you will, just for a minute. If at <coughs> five past three on the 24th of December, I sent Martin 100 quid. So, oh, please, you know, give this to my godson or something for his Christmas present. <clears throat> I sent him his 100 pound. HSBC wouldn't actually make that payment to RBS. I banked with HSBC, you banked with RBS for the purposes. Wouldn't make that payment. They wouldn't make it on the 25th because it was closed. This week, this year, 26th, 27th were Saturday and Sunday. The Monday was a holiday, 28th. It only happened on the 29th. They'd, hold, they'd held the credit for five days. They hadn't settled. Well, okay, you know, my 100 quid's are going to break the bank. But, you know, you can think that uh, the, the, the volume of payments going through fast payments is going through the roof. Uh, at some point, somebody will fail in that, in that environment. It's inevitable. So that's how it works at the moment. Now, what happens if you're called Metro Bank? You're a challenger bank. Guess what? What happens if you're Metro Bank, you have to go to one of the chats members, i.e. one of your direct competitors, and say, could you please alter the balances for me uh, at the Bank of England? So the competitor banks are sort of like, you know, like a, a, a one-legged man at an ass-kicking competition. <laughs> They're really stuffed because effectively they've got to give up an enormous amount of, um, of, of economic return to, to, um, to, to affect their daily flows of business. What happens if you're a customer down here? Well, they have to go to a correspondent bank, which has to make the change. What happens if you're Goldman Sachs? Well, Goldman Sachs is not a member of here, so they have to go to, in fact, they go to Barclays. Barclays make the change. They credit or debit the um, correspondent banking relationship of Morgan Stanley, and everything flows through. Charge, 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 <laughs> charge. Great, <laughs> fantastic. All that costs in the region at the moment, about 250 million pounds a year. 200 million odd of real cost and about 50 million of notional profit. That's what it costs the banks to operate. But when anybody in this room ever bought a house, you know what a chap's payment charge was out at. 25, 30 quid? Actually, the banks themselves pay about 12 pence to do that transfer. So that's the existing system. So we say it's perfectly possible to <coughs> drop in here a blockchain. Before we drop in a blockchain, let's ask ourselves how are we going to get money? How are we going to get the assets onto this blockchain? And there's a really simple way. <coughs> really, really easy. How do you think Barclays at the moment get the million pounds worth of tenors to put in their cash machines? Where does that actually come from? How does it occur? Well, it occurs in a really simple way, effectively. Slightly. There's a better story and there's a, there's a true story, but I'll tell the better story. <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the better story is that Barclays phone up the Bank of England and say, can I have a, a million quid of worth of tennis? The Bank of England says, yeah, yeah, sure, there you go. Put them on a truck, send them round to Barclays. When that happens, 
and the truck leaves Threadneedle Street, Barclays' settlement account at the Bank of England is debited with, you got it, a million pounds. They put it in their cash machine, because it's just like you or I going into the bank, taking out cash. It's an identical process. So they go in, the account is debited. Whizzes around the economy, it gets taken out of cash machines, it gets paid into banks, etc., etc., etc. Let's say, ease of argument, that a big slug ends up over here in settlement <coughs> bank. It doesn't matter how it gets there, but let's just say, you know, Christmas, my granny, my mother got lots of new £10 notes out, gave them to my kids. That was fine. She took them out from HSBC. My kids took them out on Boxing Day, bought absolute trash, as they always do. Gets paid back into the bank. Well, where is it going to end up? Let's say, ease of, ease of argument, statistically sensible, it would be HSBC because it's the biggest bank. So HSBC has now got rather more banknotes than it wants. So what does it do with them? Well, bearing in mind there's a little promise on the front of a banknote, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £10. What that actually means, ladies and gentlemen, is that when they pay it back into the Bank of England, the Bank of England will credit their settlement account. So HSBC, take the money in, just in the same way that anybody like us does, <coughs> takes it straight back into the bank and says, here's a million quid. The bank of England says, yeah, that's right, counted it, it's all there, fantastic, we'll credit your account. Really helpful, this banknote thing. So this RTGS system has two functions. On the one hand, if you like, on the one hand it maintains the clearing accounts for the 21, 20, oh, sorry, 23 now, uh, chats members. Second function, it's an issue and redemption service for bank notes. That's really, really important. Because when you come over here, you drop a blockchain in here, and Barclays now wants a million quid's worth of blockchain money. It doesn't want a million quid of some Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency or some nonsense like that. It wants a million pounds of real money because that's the only thing it can extinguish into bank liabilities in the UK with. So it phones up the Bank of England and it says to them, can I have a million quid's worth of blockchain money, please? The Bank of England says, yeah, just the same as getting a million quid's worth of tennis. So it can effectively, and it's, this is language that I've heard from uh, senior regulator. Um, you mean we just have to squirt the money on? <laughs> yes, that's all we have to do. You squirt it onto the public private keys associated with this particular bank. <coughs> now, this thing operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It operates on a five second clock speed. So, effectively, you can extinguish liabilities between banks four o'clock on a Sunday morning. If a, if a liability has occurred, you can extinguish it using a blockchain payment because all you're basically doing is just asserting a transaction into the system and moving it around. So then, interestingly, what happens if eventually a, a whole load of money piles up over here, they've got too much of it, got too much electronic money, what do you do with it? Just the same way as you do with cash, ladies and gentlemen, you can take it back to the Bank of England and you can credit your settlement. So it's identical. The process is really easy and really simple. And that's why we think it's so exciting. Right, now, <clears throat> let's go and have a look at something, some of this working. Okay, right. So this here, ladies and gentlemen, is a working blockchain. I'll just make sure it's spinning up properly. It appears to be. It's the Settle working blockchain. <clears throat> and it's got five nodes, East Coast, West Coast, sorry, West Coast, East Coast, London, Frankfurt, and Singapore. And we're flooding transactions onto this at the rate that chaps payments go through. So about 140, 150,000 a day, all right? Those are Bank of England statistics. We've divided them out to make sure that the the numbers are right. And we're flooding them on 10 minutes. Oh. Okay, I'll be real quick. So we're flooding them on about um, about um, the same rate that uh, uh, chaps payments go on. Uh, they're flooded out of the London node, but they could be flooded out of anywhere. We deliberately set uh, uh, geographical limits on this uh, so that we're showing real world latencies. And these are real servers <coughs> in real server farms uh, that operate in these centers. 
Uh, these are the uh, these are the actual notes. These represent the notes. And this uh, here, you'll see which which node is actually uh, proposing the block at this time. It's taking us five seconds when it's working. It's taking us five seconds to uh, write a block, and it's taking about 1.19 second to process. Let's just sorry, this is uh, just turn off these other guys for a minute. Realise it's still on. There we go. So what do those transactions look like? That's exactly what they look like. It's a key from, a key to. It's a payment from, a payment to. That's the now the ledger. It's dead easy. Just in the same way we passed the, the mobile phone round, this is all it's doing. It's moving something from, something to. Something from, something to. It's chaps, a couple of external references. There's a, a, a number of units that are moving through. And there's a, a, a time. The instrument is GB pounds. The issuer is Bank of England. And there's a unique movement ID. Right. Now, that's interesting. Interesting, yeah. But it gets quite a bit better than that. Here's our CLS simulator. This is doing exactly the same thing, but it's now doing it with euros. It's now doing it with dollars. It's now doing it with yen. It's now doing it with Aussie dollars. So we're now moving an exactly the same ledger format, key from, key to. The protocol we're using is CLS, Continuous Link Settlement. Uh, and we're actually moving, so the issuer of US dollars is the Federal Reserve. We've got a process exactly the same, in the same way that you, you get cash out of any RTGS system, you can use that to issue again. So that's it now working. So imagine you're now Jamie Dimon, sitting in his big office, looking down the canyon of skyscrapers on 6th Avenue. What do you see when you look down that? You see one building that's full of clerks that just do single-sided payments. Next door, you see another building, still same bank, but they do FX payments. Next building is another huge building full of more clerks that just do securities markets transactions. The point being, but once you've reduced it to a standard from to, from to, you can get rid of all those people. You can close down all those offices. You can make huge savings in running your business. That will be very, very, very helpful to very difficult cash-strapped uh, businesses. But effectively, there's something more here as well. What this really does, we contend, what this really does is do to payments and finance what containers do to shipping and world trade. It standardizes it. Imagine how much bigger world trade, uh, sorry, imagine how much bigger finance could be, how much more efficient it could be if you had a standardization. And this distributed ledger technology offers that capacity. But let's not stop there. Let's go and have a look. And I've got to be real fast now. Let's not just stop there. Let's have a look at uh, some crest payments, uh, some crest transactions. You won't be surprised. Identical structure, absolutely identical. So we've got some, uh, got some equities, we've got some bonds going through here, we've got some uh, uh, commercial bank money, we've got some uh, uh, central bank money. It's just moving in exactly the same way, from two, from two, from two. That's really important. Okay, now. <clears throat> Let's get into some sexy stuff. This here, I'm going to show you, this is a state view. This is the ledger now. You'll now all become treasurers of BP. You sit in your office. Your board has told you you've got to pay a dividend. At the moment, it takes six to eight weeks, and it costs a fortune to pay a dividend because there's an enormous amount of that knitting pattern that we went through at the beginning to sort out who the actual shareholders are. But this is now your new ledger. Every single shareholder can be represented down to a level of the legal entity, legal entity identifier. In fact, we can go below that. Issuer, instrument. This is how we do identity. Because in financial services, you've really got to be able to do identity. And what we mean by identity is who can you go to to find out who this key is? In this particular case, you can go to these identifiers here called Certex. Well, who are they? Well, they could be a central bank. 
You know what? They could be an accountancy firm. They could be an audit firm. They could be Swift. They could be a whole variety of different people. But they're people who could be trusted to keep the public private keys, oh, sorry, the, 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 the public key identities, to keep those public keys to be able to provide to law enforcement or regulators or anybody else. So that's quite interesting. Five minutes, right? I've got to go real fast now. <laughs> okay, so that's your ledger. Now let's do something really interesting. We talked about uh, how long it was going to take to uh, pay a dividend. So let's have a look at how do we pay a dividend. So you're the treasurer of BP, you're going to pay a dividend of uh, one pound. Uh, you're going to pay it in Bank of England sterling. Uh, you're actually BP, so let's just change that. That's fine. So you've set it all up. The board meeting has just finished and the chairman has just signed the minutes. You want to pay a dividend. Cost you a pound. All right. <coughs> commit. This is really cheesy. Are you really sure you want to commit? <laughs> Are you really sure you want to pay your dividend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the treasurer. Yeah, go on. I'll be reckless. Pay it. Uh, in a minute, <clears throat> also, did you see it flash red then? Yeah, you did. That was it paid. Every single shareholder got paid then. Now, I've got on here as well, I'm perfectly happy to show, show you, but I, I, I want to not go into it in great detail, but we've got a complete sweep of what are called smart contracts. So we've got multi-asset clearing, we've got DVP, we've got PVP, we've got single asset clearing, we've got stock loans, we've got all the sorts of standard things that financial markets need and want. Anyway, that's all very interesting. Thank you very much. But there's more. But there's more. So let's have a look now at the overall picture. This is great, Peter. You're doing 146,000 transactions a day. You know, so what? No, I'm not. <clears throat> no, I'm not. Uh, this is effectively settling every delayed net settlement system transaction on a gross basis. This is 34 million transactions a day going through the UK system. That's exactly how many there are at the moment. Taking about 1.24 on a five second spread. So we've still got plenty of capacity. Moves very, very quickly. And you do that by some clever engineering, but you also do it by some thinking about what the actual structure is. So that's great. Now, before I get beaten up by the chairman, uh, I'm just going to show you now something else. One of the questions that you might ask is, well, okay, this is great for the UK, Peter, but what about Singapore? Are they going to want to be on the UK chain? The answer is, of course, not. What about the euro? Are you going to put the euro on the same chain? The answer is, of course, not. No. You've got to have individual separated chains and those chains have got to be able to have their own jurisdiction their own shareholders their own regulators their own consensus algorithms we're using a 51 percent algorithm here just just for demonstration purposes but you could you could set it but let's say you've got to have 51 percent plus the central bank possible yeah perfectly possible etc etc et so probably in singapore you'd need 100 percent plus the central bank um, but um, <clears throat> anyway, I didn't say that. Uh, so uh, here you've got, uh, we're going to put everybody on. All right. So this is 15 chains speaking to each other, chain in, chain out, i.e. making transactions move between them. And what does that look like? <clears throat> 1.3 billion transactions a day. Globally, Globally, every electronic transaction that takes place uh, is just <coughs> over a billion at the moment. So it's 30% bigger, and that's only with 15 chains. Could you have n chains? Of course you could. So this is the power of what it means. And you know, the things I hear from from sort of people that talk about, you know, oh, well, you know, we've got to do all these syndicated loan stuff, or you've got to do stuff down the ledger and all the rest of it. Look at it. Start with the hard stuff. You know, back in the day when I was at university, my tutor, um, <clears throat> Professor Lord Weatherburn, said to me, Peter, the reason I like you is because you'll always do the hard question. You'll always do the hard essay question. And you know what? Bizarrely enough, you always got more marks for that because you could, you could get it wrong, but if you did the hard question, you'd always get more marks. That was easy because everybody else did the, the, the easy question. This is a hard question, but it's not an insoluble one. We think we've got a good, good solution here. It's becoming, um, uh, it, we're just about to uh, close the funding round. 
uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's truly, truly exciting. The commercials behind this are unbelievable. Right, I'll say no more. I'm done. Okay. You have it. Perfect timing. Yes, thank you. There you go.